So while we're waiting, I would like to encourage participants, if you are a Crossref member, to consider standing for our Board of Elections this year. And I'm going to refer you uh, to a recent blog post that we published a couple of weeks ago here, um, where we describe how to submit an expression of interest uh, to be considered by the nominating committee. And you can find or you can locate our blog at crossref.org forward slash blog. San Diego, Massachusetts. Welcome everyone, welcome. We're kicking off now. So here we are, let's get started here. So some things I'd like to mention. Uh, please make sure that you are muted. Uh, this is a call rather than a webinar. So you all have the power to unmute, but we'd ask that uh, you wait to be unmuted. Um, add your questions to the chat and our colleagues are on hand to answer them. Today's session will be recorded uh, and we will share the recording in a few days, along with the slide deck and a summary of our discussions. Uh, if you wish to share any content from today's presentations, our Twitter handle is at crossref.org uh, and use the hashtag um, uh, research Texas. And so here are our speakers and facilitators for today. I'm just gonna start at the bottom real quickly. Um, and Rosa Maurice Clark, that's me. And along with uh, Paul Davis um, and Isaac uh, Farley and Ed Pence all were involved in helping pull all this together. And they're going to be on hand to facilitate discussions and answer questions. And going across the top are our speakers, Jenny Hendricks, Director of Member and Community Outreach. And she'll start us off with a general introduction to uh, the Research Nexus, Nexus vision. Patricia Feeney will delve uh, into relationships of Crossref metadata. Martin Rittman will talk about the kinds of relationships we're capturing and planning to. Joe Wass will explain how the architecture is uh, being reinforced to support this. And Rachel Lamy will highlight the uh, two or three things we think people care about. Um, the most, and that will lead into our discussion in the breakout rooms later. So with that said, Ginny, I will hand it over to you. I'll stop sharing my screen. Thanks very much, Rosa, and hi, everyone. I'm going to jump straight in. Um, so I think every vision statement should probably be prefaced with like others, because the point of it is that it's a world we imagine in the future that involves uh, more than just Crossref, more than just us. So we know that we're playing a part in it, um, but this is the vision that we uh, share with uh, a number of members of the community. So a rich and reusable open network of relationships, connecting research organizations, people, things, and actions, a scholarly record that the global community can build on forever for the benefit of society. So I'm pretty sure nobody could disagree with that, um, which is a good thing. Uh, it's definitely a shared vision. Um, and we want to dig into today uh, a little bit about how we're seeing the journey to get there and the work that we're taking, um, working with others as well. Um, so we're going to focus quite a lot on this diagram, which uh, is, isn't too new. It's about, it's about a year old. Um, and it's trying to convey uh, all the things we have to think about and do and record um, to uh, achieve this nexus of everything being connected. So in the past, you'll definitely have heard all of us talk about predominantly those things in the center, which are objects and entities that need to be identified. So in the center there, you'll see um, videos, preprints, um, grants, conference papers, articles and books, of course, and all of those need persistent identifiers. Um, you'll also see contributors there. So that's, of course, ORCID, and you'll see organizations there. And that's, of course, RAW. So uh, this isn't just the Crossref picture. This is sort of um, uh, trying to convey the, the full picture. Um, it is aspirational, so uh, these clusters and categories around the outside are our ways of trying to group all of the different types of relationships, actions, entities uh, that we're trying to link together. Uh, so whilst we would have focused very heavily on the identifiers and just um, uh, 
uh, identifying that something exists and I have a little bit of information about it at the center, we're now wanting to move the conversation on to the relationships between those. We want to add context. Where do these objects sit in the whole research ecosystem? So we're looking at um, the funding area. So we already collect things like grants um, and facilities. Uh, we're looking at creates, uh, even publishes it's more information than just article was posted. There's information such as moving URLs, republishing, uh, transferal of titles and things like that. Um, there's lots of commentary, discussion before and after something's published um, that we're starting to capture through um, event data and things like that. And modifications to these objects as well. So corrections and retractions, we certainly capture and could could do more of that um, but as I say this is quite aspirational so what if we could also capture whether something's been uh, replicated or reused or whether it's something's been refuted or disproved um, so it's definitely a vision rather than the current picture but we're on we're on the way there so the way we're thinking about metadata and relationships has evolved a little bit so these first two bullet points really were what we were originally focused on what what most people are focused on can we identify that something exists an object or an organization or a funder or um, some kind of entity and what information can we find out about it now we want to also collect and share information about how they relate to each other you could have uh, all of those objects with many lines between them but what do those lines mean what are those connections we want to record what happens to the record over time and how these relationships change and evolve uh, we want to gather assertions from uh, more parties than just the original publisher we've started to do that a little bit and we um, are also looking to um, uh, convey what we might have previously assumed to be kind of internal information, maybe administrative stuff we keep in our in our member database, for example, like who deposited it, who's updating the record, who's maintaining it, who's hosting that content, um, who's, who's paying for that um, over time as well with Crossref. Um, and that's the kind of information we want to uh, convey uh, and uh, open up, basically. Um, we're not the first to think about this evolved scholarly record, and this is um, quite an old uh, report from OCLC Research. In 2014, they, they talked about um, the evolving scholarly record, and then in 2015 followed it up with this uh, focus on the stewardship, so the responsibilities and actions that need to be taken to share the the stewardship of this evolving scholarly record so they're still focused on the outcomes at the center as you said as we as we see with ours um but there's also method evidence discussion before and after and the revisions and modifications and reuse as well um, and this is a really nice quote from their 2015 report um, so i'll just let you read that for a minute So it really mirrors what we're what we're envisioning. So I think the key points uh, for my for my intro really is this is a reflection of where we see the community is heading. It's not new. It's not just something we've just come up with. Um, we really want to press the point that identifiers are definitely necessary, but they are not sufficient. We need to focus on the the wider context, uh, which includes metadata and relationships. Um, and what we think of as metadata is expanding the notion of content and types is evolving and you'll hear today about how we're trying to kind of break out of those um, molds um, and again the research nexus this vision belongs to us all it's a collective responsibility um, one of the things that the oclc report talks about is the um, uh, conscious um, collective i think of coordinates conscious coordination uh, of the scholarly record and i think that's that's a nice term i think we could all relate to so I'm going to hand over to Patricia now, who will um, talk a little bit more about relationships in our metadata and how we're trying to move that model forward. I'm going to share your screen, Patricia. Yes. All right. Um, 
Yeah, so as Jenny mentioned, I'm going to talk about the relationships that are present in our metadata already and our visions for supporting them across a spectrum of research outputs. So as we just heard, the re this idea of the research nexus connects all kinds of outputs as well as things considered parts of those outputs like contributor and affiliation information, funding and citations. And we've been, so we've been collecting re relationships in some form between, between registered items for a while through updates like retractions and corrections supplied through Crossmark, and we collect citations and components. Um, we make other met metadata connections as well through ORCID IDs, ROAR IDs, and funder IDs. Um, these connections aren't between items re registered with the DOI record, but between parts of a record registered with us, so within records, um, which is uh, identifiers really help with that. But explicit I'm relationships. Sorry. I'm sorry, Patricia, we yeah. can see the wrong screen. Yes. Oh, yep. <laughs> Thank you. Thanks. Um, I think if you want to share, then reshare the, a different one. Weird. So now, are you seeing the right screen? Yes. Yeah. Yes. Thank okay. you. <laughs> All right. I forgot where I was. Yeah, anyway, as we as we move towards more of a nexus inspired approach, we want to blur the boundaries between types of objects. Um, we've always really called different sor sorts of supported records content types, but that's a very rigid way of thinking and doesn't really um, reflect the reality of the materials used to support and communicate research. Um, but it's also really important um, that for metadata to uh, identify uh, things for discoverability. So I'm gonna talk a bit about what we support now and later we'll hear more about how we can potentially expand support to create a true nexus of research. So this is what we have registered now. Um, so we, this isn't entirely comprehensive, but it's, it's kind of an overview of the most registered content types. Um, as you can see, uh, the majority of registrations are for journal articles and books, maybe some conference pa papers, um, and significantly smaller amounts of other types of content. But if you look at what's been really picking up momentum over the past few years, um, as we, you know, our membership has really been diversifying and we have a lot of members who want to register new types of content, uh, the new, newer content types have a greater rate of growth. Um, there's also a big jump in data sets. Um, sometimes we think of that as almost like a dumping ground, like you, that's where you register something if you don't know where else to put it because it's really flexible metadata. Um, so I, I think that's particularly significant. Um, I think a lot of things that we don't explicitly support like posters and protocols are registered as data sets. Um, if we look at the nexus oriented metadata we do collect, there are some uh, clear leaders here. We have a lot of references, licenses, affiliations, and some, some ORCID IDs. Um, but if you take a look at um, records that have been well, with a publication or created or posted date since 2019, so last three years, um, over half have references, affiliations are picking up quite a bit. And we've only, we've recently added support for the Rory identifier um, to create more uh, persistent and uh, unambiguous connections. Um, we also have a higher rate of ORCID ID and vendor adoptions and relationships are growing as well. Um, so in Crossref records, um, as I mentioned with the, whole data set idea of what's actually registered with us as a data set. A book is not always a book. A journal article is not always a research article or even part of a journal. It's more about whether the metadata of that item fits the metadata we collect for a given type and how it's best represented in outputs. Um, our input schema currently defines what we collect as XML and how it's labeled and modeled. Um, this has worked well for many years, but it's time to evolve a bit more 
um, these silos restrict us all to clearly define mature types of content like books and journal articles and really make it hard for us at Crossref to be responsive to our to what our membership needs. So looking to the future, we'll be building a more flexible metadata model that will, um, I guess you could say unsilo content, but also allow it to be clearly defined. So what we're thinking is consistent markup across content types. This doesn't necessarily mean marked up with XML. It just, you know, it could be schema.org or, or some other format, JSON. Uh, less rigid requirements and more metadata where you actually need it, like at the container level for journals um, or metadata that allows records to be connected in really flexible ways. Um, obviously, we still need to be able to define what we're collecting and call a book chapter a book chapter and have that be identified as such. But um, we'd like to introduce some flexibility both for us and for our members who supply us metadata. And we hope that this will allow uh, members to register things like conference events, posters, protocols, research modules, and more um, a lot easier. Um, and I do want to say so that no one panics. That doesn't mean we're abandoning the way we currently do things. I don't see us abandoning XML support for XML in the foreseeable future. And we really hope to expand support for accepting dots directly. Um, so we are starting to build connections relationship with relationships already. These are the relationships we um, currently support. They are very publishing centric, but we'll be having conversations with the community to grow this in different ways. And these are the relationship our members provide most often. Um, so the most provided relationships are the ones that currently are required, like um, reviews are required to uh, provide a relationship to a reviewed item, a, a DOI specifically, and or that have strong best practices like preprints are um, strongly urged and uh, to uh, connect with a journal article when it's, when it's published through a relationship. We have other important relationships that we would like to connect, collect and that I think are present kind of out there for people to send us like funding uh, relationships, translations and versions are, are some big ones. Um, so just to finish up um, in later talks, you'll hear more about our technical and product development. Um, but we're getting to a point where we can more easily support a range of requests and make changes more effective and efficient. So we're going to do more engagement to make sure we solidify these connections within the research nexus and go beyond relationships. So um, I am going to start communicating requests and progress on metadata requests via a Trello board. We do have a Crossref roadmap, so this is more just to um, collect engage interest in the community and communicate with you what other people are asking us for because one of the things we questions we often get is well has anyone asked you about whatever you know so i think it would be good to you know communicate about that um openly um so hopefully in the future i think in the fact in the past we always haven't been able to act quickly but with some new developments i hope we'll be able to say yes to request more often, or yes, let's have a, a discussion about this at least. Um, and we'll be able to um, hopefully communicate. All right. Um, I do have a poll to pop up. Yes, Patricia, I'm going to suggest that we do the poll um, after Martin's talk because okay, that's, I'm... That's like, good because I got an internet is unstable error, so... Okay. <laughs> All right, <laughs> we'll do that in about 10 minutes and move on to Martin. <laughs> Right, if I can unmute myself, I can start talking to you. Right, yeah, hello everyone. It's, it's really nice to um, to have the opportunity to uh, to talk to you all. Um, uh, so yeah, I'll be I'll be looking into a little bit more of the 
I guess, the outer reaches of the research nexus. So, so what Patricia has, has talked about um, was about the, the things that are in the Crossref um, database um, and, and things that our members provide to us. Um, but there are other things, there's a whole wealth of really interesting you know, research stuff that you know, exists outside of Crossref. As, as Ginny said, we are far from alone in this space. And, and so we would like to build relationships between what we have and what other people hold as well. And here's, here's one example. So um, the publisher here, Cargo, has, um, uh, has published this article and it has supplementary material. And if you click this link, you will go to a site on uh, to where well, you'll go to Figshare, and, and this is the um, the, the data set. Um, and it's great that they have that that link. The data set has a DOI, um, but the DOI is is registered not with Crossref but with another DOI registration agency data site. Um, and um, so you know we we are trying to build. We're work, working with data site to um, kind of pull the the data citations that we have from our side and that they have from their side, um, and those are be, being delivered via, um, uh, are being available via event data. Um, and in this case, the publisher has really helpfully put in the um, metadata deposit. Um, this is part of the metadata, the Crossref metadata for the research article that there's a relation is supplemented by, it, and then there's the, the DOI of the, um, of the data set. So this is really helpful. Um, but there are other objects out there which are interesting, but that may, you know, they don't have a DOI. Um, they may have another kind of identifier um, and, and they're part of the, you know, the research literature as well. So I'm thinking about things like policy documents, technical documents, patents, these kind of things. Um, and here's a, a, an example here of a um, post note. So this is a kind of advisory document which is used by the UK Parliament. Um, and it has a, um, it, these are really interesting documents. I would recommend you go and read them if, if, you're, if, you, if you'd like to. Um, but they have a reference section, which looks very much like a reference section from a research article. And one of the references here is to this um, article by Wilson um, et al. And I'm sure that the authors here will be really interested to know that their um, article has been picked up in this way. Um, but not just the authors, also the um, the funders, the authors' research institutions, and um, you know the publisher as well would be interested to know that um, that the, the research is being used and it, it's being connected to to other documents. So this is you know part of something we consider as part of the research nexus, and um, I have to say this is difficult information to get. You know these these kinds of documents are often in PDFs and the the references are not available, but. You know, we'd love to um, to get more of, uh, of these kind of relationships into our database, and I'll talk to um, yeah, talk to a few more examples, and then explain kind of how we what we are doing with these relationships. Um, so here's another example. At um, the beginning of the year, um, I read this really interesting article on the BBC news website about um, uh, sleep patterns, um, uh, and if I'd wanted to um, to know more. I could have followed some of the links that the journalist Saria Gorvet um, included in the article um, and, and got back to some of the original published research that, that was cited there. Um, uh, and and this, is, this is one of the articles. And um, again, you know, the authors, the funders, the publishers, uh, uh, you know, the institutions would be really interested to know um, that. Um, uh, that their research is, is being picked up in this way and, and used by, by journalists and to see how it's been received because, you know, with news websites, blogs and, uh, uh, and, and other websites, there is potential for kind of amplification of the message of the, of the articles, but also misuse as well. And, and that's important for people to know. Um, and again, we consider that part of the research nexus, but it's something that lies, you know, the, these these websites lie outside of our um, our database. So here's um, uh, yeah another example: social media. Of course, social media is everywhere these days. There's all sorts of um, all sorts of things going on on social media, and this is just one example. Um, I, I don't read Japanese, but you know, this this is about um, use of uh, images on on YouTube, um, uh, and um, the. Uh, again, you know the, the the authors and and various other um, 
parties will be interested in, in knowing what's going on on social media, what's getting picked up, what isn't get, getting picked up, what's being said about the research and there's conversations, there's feedback, uh, you know, there's, there's useful things that can be said. It's part of the, it's part of the conversation of, um, that happens around um, research. And it's something that we do pick up already um, via um, event data. Um, and, and we, you know, we make those available. Um, but we're we're thinking um, a little bit uh, well. We're thinking at the moment about what more we could do with th these kind of um, relationships and, and the way that that those things are brought together. And there are other examples that you could think of. You know, there are organisations that do um, credit kudos annotations for research works. Um, grant funding is a really uh, uh, important um, uh, area that's that's you know falls well within the research. Nexus and that we're kind of starting to do more of. Um, people in institutions have identifiers as well that we can link back to, to research. Um, uh, research gets modified, republished, translated. Um, these are all interesting things that readers um, and authors would like to know about. Uh, and educational materials as well is a, is a really interesting area of um, reuse of, of research. Um, and so, yeah, time for a, a quick poll. Um, so I would like to ask the question, imagine it's, um, you know, tomorrow is your birthday and the metadata fairy comes along and gives you a present. Um, it's something you don't have already. And I'm just wondering which of these areas here that you can see, that you can see, would you like to have um, more of? So this isn't kind of what you're already interested in, but if there was one of these examples, um, that you would like to pick up in the future and you would like to know about how it relates to uh, either the work that you're publishing or the you know the, the authors that you're related to are publishing yeah what would that be um, so i'll give you a, a few moments to uh, to answer that Yeah, I can just while you're doing that, I can just answer, answer as a question about um, yeah, institutions want to know the social impact. Yeah, that's that's a really helpful um, comment. Thanks. And um, yeah, I mean, th there's a term alt metric. It, it's not a metric that we're providing, but we're kind of providing links um, between uh, between things. If people want to kind of make scores and metrics out of that, yes, they can do. And a lot of the data that we've been looking at, especially with event data in the past. Um, has been the kind of things that you'd find from alt metrics. I would say not as comprehensive as you know commercial alt metrics providers, but it's similar kind of stuff. Okay, I'll um, yeah, I'll end the poll there. So that's really uh, really interesting, and I can share the results. I think so. Um, okay, so can people see the results? Because I just had a a note that said it didn't work. Um, but anyway, that so that at the top, thirty-three percent is data and software, and then followed nineteen percent by people's and institution people and institutions, and, and seventeen percent by policy and technical documents. So yeah, that's really interesting. Um, so yeah, thanks for for filling that in. I, that that gives us an idea of the kind of things that people are interested in. So what if I told you that you could find all of these relationships um, in one place? Um, that there was an API that you could query and get back all of these examples plus the, the stuff that Patricia was talking about earlier. Well, if I did say that to you, I would be lying, but we're working on it. Um, uh, and the, the first step to, to, to working on, on this is to rethink our data model and how we store the, the, the data. Can we make it, um, as, as Patricia was saying earlier, can we store things in a slightly more flexible way so that we can put different kinds of items alongside each other? So you can think of, um, you know, you can think of uh, articles referencing articles. This is a relationship. Uh, you know, there's an item on one side, there's an item on another side, and there's some kind of relationship um, description in the middle. Um, we can generalize this quite easily to websites or news articles or tweets or Wikipedia pages. Um, say these mention or cite or reference or whatever or comment on um, a, an article. Uh, we can also generalize it to people and institutions. So we can say a funder funds an article. So we can represent fu uh, funder data 
in, in the same relational way. Um, we can also um, assign properties to things. So we can say that an article, so this is an item, it has a publication date, this is a relationship. And then on this side now we have a property, so we have a date. Um, but we can use the same kind of language to describe um, this. And we can also say, you know, maybe a website had a link to a research article and that we find out that it was removed. You know, we can say, well, actually, this website doesn't mention this article anymore. And, and that's also useful information. Um, so <clears throat> based on this kind of data model, we're prototyping a relationships API endpoint. So you can query something like a DOI and you can get back all of the, the relationships um, and the, the links that we, that we have and that we would like to, to gather in the future. Um, so this is kind of a, a merging of some of the services that we provide already. So there's a metadata, there's a relationship metadata that Patricia talked about earlier. Um, there's event data, which includes more of the things like websites and social media and Wikipedia and um, uh, re reviews and, and annotations and, and this kind of data that we've been collecting for a few years. Um, and also um, cited by. So if you would like to, you know, to ask the question, what, what in the Crossref database cites this article? It's, it's actually quite difficult to answer in the way that our data is structured at the moment. If you're the member, you can use us, uh, the deposited an article, but you can use our cited by service to answer that question. But we would like to make that kind of data much more visible. And we, we think there's a real community um, um, need that will be served by, by doing that. Um, and so, you know, what can we do with this? Well, there's this, this slide, um, don't take this too much at face value, but this is kind of aspirational of where we would like to go and the kind of questions that we would like you to be able to answer um, with, the, uh, with the relationships API. Um, so things like, you know, I published an article, I'm an author, show me everywhere online that's mentioned my article from citations to tweets, to data sets, to reuses and translations and, you know, everything. Um, we can also ask slightly more subtle questions. So, um, you know, filtered, filtered questions. So which Wikipedia pages mentioned articles that came from this specific journal in this specific year? Or how many preprints from this Crossref, Crossref member have associated data sets? You know, that could be a really interesting question to ask from the point of view um, of open science. Um, and the data is kind of there, but it's not really very accessible at the moment. Um, also, you know, show me citations where Crossref have added the DOI. So I, what I didn't really talk about is, is that when we're thinking about this, the, creating these relations, we can also store information about who asserted this. Um, um, so, for example, members deposit references without a DOI added, um, and Crossref adds that DOI. You know, we, you could ask the question, what did Crossref add? Or, you know, what did the member add? Or what did a third party add um, to this metadata record? Or, you know, do, do this author's papers get mentioned on Twitter uh, and news websites? So there, you know, the research article is not really at the center, um, but it's, it's centered on the author or another kind of item. And we're also really interested in making those kind of queries possible. Um, and so we've, we've kind of started to build this kind of um, a, a database um, steps towards this API. We have some, you know, very talented development team uh, working on this, it's still relatively early days, um, and I think I, that's probably a good point for me to hand over to Joe, um, who will give all, all the all the technical caveats about making this work and, and the hard work that that's actually um, behind it. Thank you, Martin. Just before we go to to Joe's uh, talk, which is yeah, getting into how we're actually going to build this, um, Patricia, do you want to do your poll now? We can get a sense of types of relationships people are. Uh, already collecting? Uh, sure. Okay, let me launch this. Okay. Everybody see that poll? I'll let you talk through it. Oh yeah, I'm just we're just trying to see um, what relationships you currently either collect or use just to, to gauge interest in what, what's available out there. And there's also a second question, so please scroll down.
Okay, the answers are slowing down a little bit, so I'm going to end the poll there and share the results. Great. Looks like a lot of people are, well, references is always very popular, but versions and, fun, and funding. And it looks like a lot of people are already sending some of them. It's great. Thank you, everyone. All right, thank you. Joe, you're up. Great. Hi, everyone. Give me a second. And you see that? Yeah, that looks good. You see the, uh, that, that page? Cool. Hi, I'm Joe Watts, Head of Software Development. Um, this is all very exciting. Um, I'm going to bring us slightly back down to earth just, just for a moment uh, to talk about technical debt. Uh, you may have heard us talking about technical debt in the past. Um, this describes things about our software systems that make them a little bit hard to work with. And they're, they're very normal things, right? They crop up over time in any system, and they're the result of taking decisions day to day over a period of time. And the kinds of technical debt that we've been dealing with range from you know, small bugs through to the lack of an automatic test suite through to larger things like database choices or system architecture. So we've spent the past couple of years addressing this technical debt as and when it arises and makes life difficult for developers. Tech debt is only really a problem when you try to make the system do something different to what it was fundamentally intended to do. Um, and when it starts to slow down progress, right, that's the time to, to try and tackle it. So the research nexus is an expression of not only where we think the community is going, but also where we want to go. Um, and it poses a real challenge for our technology. Like how far can we stretch the legacy system? And at what point do we want to try and build something new? And how do we draw that line between old and new technology? Because we don't want to waste energy building new stuff just for the sake of it. It's a quite a tricky question to answer. And the research nexus gives us a great context for doing that evaluation and helping us to answer those times. So, so what are we going to build? Uh, we're currently focused on building the relationships functionality that Martin was just discussing. Um, and in order to do that, we do need to build out some new technology. And we're taking this opportunity to use modern stuff like Postgres, JSON schema, Kotlin, full automatic test suite, and many other things like that. Uh, and we have been converging on the research nexus idea for, for quite a few years now. So at the heart of our new technology uh, are code and data models that were developed as part of our existing REST API and event data services. Um, and that code and that data model, model represents a significant technical asset that we've been building. So that is at the heart of the new stuff we're building as well. And what we're doing is all open source. So anybody is welcome to see what we're doing and even try running it themselves. And by the way, that's not everything we're working on. At the same as this, uh, we're continuing working on bug fixes and small features. We're also putting a lot of effort into new foundations for user interfaces and authorization. That's not directly about the research nexus, but it is about a more kind of self-service and kind of embracing the increasing diversity of our community. So that's happening at the same time. Um, and as we've got more ambitious, um, we're thinking about making more changes. So we've been working on our methodology um, to help us coordinate these bigger changes um, as we get more ambitious. But really, I think the most important thing, apart from the technology, is that we build a software system that really acknowledges, I just got a poll popped up, sorry, <laughs> uh, that really acknowledges um, where we are in the research ecosystem and which um, gives us the best chance of playing the best part we can in the research nexus. And we can build software systems that really play to the strengths of where we are. Um, so what we aim to build can, will, will, you know, will coexist and integrate with other um, organizations and registration agencies um, and really built an acknowledgement of the, the, the role that those parties play as well. So on your systems, we'll store Crossref members metadata, metadata from Crossref members, as well as metadata from other places. Um, in a single item graph, in a single database. And this will lower the barrier for integrating data from various places, internal and external, and kind of dissolving that boundary a bit. And we're also using JSON schema to model um, evolvable schemas 
so we can kind of change our representation of the data over time. Um, just as the relationships uh, functionality we're building is a fundamentally new way of looking at our metadata, um, that will enable a whole new generation of functionality in our API. And likewise, the new tech stack that we're building for that will serve as a platform for lots of new features that will hopefully speed up development work in future. And that will ultimately help us serve the community better. So this is all work in progress and we have nothing exactly to show yet, but do keep a lookout for announcements um, on our blog. Thank you. I think uh, Rachel, are you next? Yes, I think I am. So let me go ahead and share my screen. Does that look okay? Give me a thumbs up if so. Excellent, thank you. Um, so I'm going to kind of continue the theme of kind of keeping us down to earth. Martin, you got to do the Christmas presents. Um, I think this is sort of the equivalent of, you know, finding some money down the back of the sofa that you forgot that you had or a, a, a packet of biscuits three weeks after Christmas, whenever you need a bit of a, a bit of a pick me up. That's that's probably quite a bad analogy, but let's let's go with it. But I wanted to kind of talk about, um, you know, how, um, how we can work together um, to, to try to kind of, um, to try to get further towards achieving this, um, this idea of the research nexus, and just to make these connections between, um, between the, the information that we hold, evolving that, and also linking it to other um, information that's being contributed and collected by like-minded or like-minded organizations in our community. So, I think from the um, you know from this perspective, I can I can look at the um, the I can look at this diagram, and I think as you know some of my um, you know my colleagues have emphasised, this is something that we that we want to work towards as a as a community, um, and I think I saw a, a message in the chat to say you know not having articles sit at the centre of this. Um, you know, to be able to sort of hinge off any of these items that sit in the center and be able to find the information is, is really more towards what we want to support. And I think the other thing to, to stress, again, my colleagues have mentioned this, that it's not solely on Crossref to, you know, to, to be the kind of the, the hub for all of this information, you know, exchanging it with, um, with Datasite, with ORCID, with our members, um, with with others in the community, um, is is really key to being able to to build this picture. So I was tasked um, in talking about sort of what we can do now. Um, it was interesting in the polls that um, that folks already flagged up things like linking um, to data and software, and the other way. Um, being able to identify people in institutions and also being able to, to link between research outputs and funding and grant information and the other way around. So those are three things I sort of wanted to, to focus on now. Um, in case you... Um, in case you haven't been sort of convinced um, thus far, certainly um, an area that we've been working um, with our community a lot on and with um, folks in the wider community, for example, from um, Datasite and um, the Make Data Count project is supporting our members in being able to, um, to be able to consistently cite data in their, their metadata. Um, for the reasons that I list here, helping with transparency, reproducibility, helping people, um, you know, helping people identify um, and be able to reuse the um, published data in their own works. Um, and also just so that um, so that folks can get credit or recognition for the for the work that they've done. Um, I think this this feels really this feels really important. Um, and I think it's something that, you know, there are conversations to um, to support the way that we that we cite and we link to data that have started probably about um, certainly the ones that we've been involved in, with in Crossref, you know, sort of six, seven, eight years ago. Um, and now we're sort of seeing this uptake in the, the recognition and the population of this information from the community. Um, really simply, as you know, 
adding links to um, related data and software in your in your reference lists in the same way that you would add other links to to other um, to other related works is is as is as simple as it gets. But we also recognize that there are sort of, you know, there are workflow issues that we need to support in terms of doing that. But I think even in the past sort of um, in the past year, we've seen a real uptake in folks being able to prov provide that information. And I think as part of our members providing that information, what we want to do is make sure that we're good stewards of it. So as Martin explained, um, being able to pass links between articles and data to folks like Datasight and to, to take um, those links back from data sites so our members can see what data is citing them and to amplify that through things like event data, the relationships API, and also our Scholix endpoint. So exposing that information in standard ways means that it can be reused to the, max, the maximum extent possible by the research community. Um, you've also heard us um, talk a lot about um, about ROAR identifiers and um, again, you know, being able to, to link out to people and institutions is, is really key. Um, you know, Nicholas, I think you mentioned, um, you know, institutions wanting to know sort of the, the, the outputs of their, of their researchers. And um, around a year ago, we started to support the registration of ROAR identifiers with all of the, the content types that we collect at Crossref. And um, we're just approaching, and this, these are figures from last week, around eight and a half thousand ROAR IDs having been registered as part of our member metadata, um, which is, which, which is, you know, is a, is a starting point, but I wanted to flag that that, that represents an increase of 120% since, um, since we started to expose that information via our API in January. Um, we're seeing lots of different ROAR IDs registered, so being related to lots of different um, organisations. And, you know, certainly kudos to our funder members in terms of um, the population of ROAR identifiers in grant metadata. Um, but you can you can see in the screenshot from our, um, our REST API down to the bottom right, I can see some um, of our publisher members starting to, um, to sneak up that list. Um, and I think I saw a couple of um, early ROAR identifiers um, registered by the Centre for Open Science early this week. So, um, so I think if I'm giving this presentation, even in a couple of months time, we'll, we'll see a lot of difference. Um, why, why have we, um, you know, why have organizations kind of centered around ROAR as a means to, to collect this information? Um, and why, why are we interested in it in the first place? Um, I've listed some reasons here, um, you know, from publisher or editor workflows where you want to, to see, you know, where your authors and reviewers are coming from, potentially to avoid conflicts of interest or to give you other insights into your, um, into your communities and your um, your authors and, and your readers um, is useful. Um, from a funder perspective, um, again, it gives them another mechanism to be able to, to get feedback on um, the researchers that they've supported and the outputs related to the research that they fund. Um, publications related to a specific campus um, and also for as a means to, to be able to support things like transformative agreements. Um, I can, I'm also sure that you can think of lots of your own examples. Um, and I've mentioned funders um, a couple of times. Um, again, for context, um, we've had um, funders um, starting, I think from 2019, starting to register research grants with us. So identifiers and metadata specific to, um, to distinct grants. Um, and we've we've reached nearly 40,000 of those being registered um, with Crossref. So again, now that we've got metadata related to um, a specific grant and we've got research um, out, different research outputs, articles, books, preprints that reference specific funders and also in many instances, specific grant numbers. Um, my colleague, um, Dominika Tkacek, um, did a really excellent piece of work looking at this information. There's a link to the blog post in the slides, um, but she exposed um, over 20 
nearly 21,000 links between research outputs and registered grants. So that's sort of 10% of all registered grants so far. Um, we know that we're still early in the process. And I think I would add that a lot of the grants that are being registered with us are for, in many instances, they're sort of for um, relatively new grants. So the outputs will probably appear further, further downstream. So again, you know, watch, watch this space. But um, again, it sort of helps build that, that bigger picture and be able to show what the outputs are at a, at a grant level and also for funders to be able to communicate that information too which is which is really valuable in terms of that sort of transparency within the um um within the the, the research ecosystem and i think again i would stress that's why we want to make this information openly available as opposed to you know as opposed to you know, areas in which the information can be guarded because we think that we all stand to benefit more um, by, by making this information openly available. Um, I've got to, I'm going to jump to a poll now. Um, so again, giving you quite a limited Christmas list, um, I, I'd be, we'd be really interested to know if there are specific areas here that you're tackling in your organisation that you're thinking about, um, that you'd like to find out more. I think the other thing that I'd stress is while you're um, is while you're thinking and voting is that we also know that we want to do more within Crossref to help support um, our members, our service providers um, and and people in the wider community in terms of providing this information. So we are close to releasing a beta version of a user interface for funders to more easily register grants. And that will collect things like raw identifiers um, as standard within that. Um, we're thinking about how we can better encourage data citation and support that. Um, and, you know, again, the, the funding work that, um, that Dominica did, again, sort of um, helps to inform the, the, kind of, the kind of matching or the kind of work that we can do to assert these relationships and these links. So um, we know that our members have really long wish lists but at the same time, we know that we, you know, we, we want to kind of meet in the middle in terms of being able to, to you know, to, to cater to those. Um, I'm going to end the poll. Um, data citation looks healthy, um, which is good because I've been talking about it for ages and there's an RDI plenary coming up next week. So, um, so that's helpful. Um, outputs and funding information. Again, I know that we've been collecting information at the funder level for around sort of 10 years now. So that's, you know, that that's really useful information um, and collecting and using raw identifiers. Again, I expect to see that um, to grow. But yeah, thanks. Thanks for your feedback on that. Um, the last thing I want to jump to is just, um, and this is sort of with um, my sort of R&D hat on is to talk a little bit about um, a project that, um, that my colleague Esha Dada is leading um, to look at classifications in the Crossref metadata. Again, these could be a mechanism to be able to link together related research, um, but we're, we're doing some work to, to find out how that is. Um, if you're familiar with the Crossref metadata, you might think, hey, you've already got subject classifications in there. And we have dipped into that in the past um, based on um, the AJSC subject classifications from, um, from an Excel file that um, the Elsevier host on their website and they use within Scopus. So we sort of dipped into that and then sort of made the, the fatal mistake with an experiment with letting them creep into production releases of our API and other tools, even though we knew that there were a few problems with um, the way that we'd done this. Um, so for the, um, for the sake of transparency, um, we know that, um, that we're exposing these in the API as a property of the work, um, when actually they're, um, the class, the, the subject level information is a property of the, the journal level. And we also expose them at that, but we're, we're conscious that we're sort of, we're conflating two things. Um, we initially didn't update these periodically. Um, so we know that there are some older incorrect classifications hanging around the place and we don't apply them to everything. 
um, because the Elsevier list doesn't cover all the journals that we have. And um, we also probably don't have some from them. So, um, so we, we've done some, we've had to do some work to try to match, to match these up. And the way that we're trying to address some of these issues is um, Aisha is working to, um, to train up a classifier to, to use that list um, and see if we can, to see if we can match that, to see if we can apply those classifications at the journal level with enough confidence so that then we could apply them to a much larger portion of our corpus. And then that would help by downstream usage of our community. Um, now here's the if, um, and Esha, you can you can jump in if you've anything to add, but we would need to figure out if we can do this with a good level of confidence, um, and we'd also want to to the point of you know who's asserting what, make a d distinction between the classifications we get from Elsevier and the ones that we generate from our classifier. So we've been looking at trying to match those um, initial classifications and the allocation of those. Um, using things like the journal title. Um, as a spoiler, it's not amazingly accurate. Um, so looking at article titles and then potentially um, dipping into um, more deep learning approaches to see the, to see the, the results that we get, which again, we'll, we'll share more widely once we, um, once we have a bit more to share with the community. So um, again, it's, this is the, the work that we are doing in house, but we're also conscious of conversations that are happening with force and um, via the Skull Calm Lab and via other members of our community. Um, for example, Open Alex support this as well. Um, so we 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 think that this is again one of those things that certainly lends itself to a wider community approach in terms of in terms of figuring out the extent to which we can we can solve this issue and improve the information.